I've almost recovered. I'm going to group therapy. I'm doing the work. So what's the harm in downloading a dating app or in going on just one little date? All right, I'll admit it's not exactly what they tell us to do in the sex and love addicts group, but what do they know? They think everyone they meet is a narcissist. Except when they actually meet a narcissist and then they think they're their true twin flame. (laughs) My point is, if we all waited until we were emotionally stable and happy and healthy before we got into a relationship, no one would go out with anyone, would they? And then wouldn't life be dull? I think you know what I mean. Do you know what I mean? And if you do, what did you do about it? How did you get unhooked? I'm joined here by the author, playwright, thespian, Ella Skolomowski. Ella, welcome back again. Hello. Thanks for having me back, my love. Ella, uh, you're you're having a well-deserved break during rehearsals for Mm -hmm. your new production that's coming up in Smock Alley, which we will talk about fairly shortly, but just for the benefit of those who didn't catch us the last time around, tell people what's your background in theatre and writing, of course. Mm. Well, I'm mainly a playwright, but recently I've been producing a lot of solo shows and working more in the realms of a writer-performer, Michael, so I had... Uh, a play on last summer at the International Dublin Gay Theatre Festival called Looking Sis, which I know you were at. Um, that was a that was a full run. I had such a good time doing that. I've continued my practice in the direction of making really kind of agile, interesting solo shows. I kind of trying to see how much of a world you can build and how many characters you can bring in and what kind of stories you can tell when you're using just one performer. So it's been a real a really exciting creative challenge. Now, I should let the audience in on the secret that when I first came across you, or came upon you, shall we say, it was through porn. Yes. And now porn, I'm not saying that you are one of those what we not, call skin actresses star, or yeah. <laughs> at all. You weren't one of those uh, Stormy Daniels or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It was a... Uh, it was a reading in the, again, the Dublin Gay Theatre Festival, International yeah. Dublin Gay Theatre Festival. Yeah. Um, what was that all about and what, uh, what happened as a result of that? Well, porn was a really great little three-hander that I wrote, which was around the themes of revenge porn, amateur content making, coercive control and relationships and all these kind of different elements. So the three characters were a couple who have decided to make porn together to supplement their income and then a very young and naive and quite a lovable femboy character that they, they pick up along the way and try to bring into their burgeoning empire. So mm-hmm. that's that script is still in development. It had a run um, at Smock Alley and Seen and Heard in 2022. Um, it had that reading at the, the Dublin Gay Theatre Festival that you just mentioned, Mick, but I'm still working on reworking that into a full-length piece that's going to bring in some new angles because I want to look at some of the things that have changed around porn production and some of the new angles that are coming in like the use of AI and deep fakes to to blackmail and manipulate people who actually may never have engaged with this content at all. Of course it does help to have a catchy title doesn't it to get the audience uh, attention. That's what I've heard recently I've heard you want like an arresting one word title which I think is where my mind goes often anyway so that's a happy accident. Well, it depends on where you go. I mean, uh, I've always thought like um, streetcar named Desire. Well, that's true. That's very. Uh, that is. It's a bit longer than porn, or, <laughs> <laughs> or, or even Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and she wasn't even in the play. So, <laughs> yeah. but we were always uh, interested in writing. You know, from the days when you were a mere whippersnapper, or yes. is this a mature uh, Ella uh, adventure? Oh, that's a good question. It's. The answer is somewhere between the two. I've mm. had a really long writing career, but much of that early work was in non-fiction writing. So I did some monographs, wrote some history books, I did some journalism like mm. you do yourself, Mick. Um, it's only in the last kind of four years that I've had that urge to just do something mm. creative and to play with characters. So it is kind of, it's a new, uh, a new departure for me, although obviously I've got transferable skills to draw. I mean, having 
uh, shall we say, worked in the area of particularly journalism, mm -hmm. you tend to have to write within certain parameters. Yeah. Is, is, uh, is creative writing, or particularly artistic writing, is it more liberating? No. no. <laughs> not, not when you're writing for stage, and not when you're working as a solo theatre maker, because you always have to have in mind the logistics of production and the constraints of working with one performer when you're writing the piece. I mean, recently I've been playing a little bit with writing screenplays and that is liberating and that's exciting mm -hmm. because you can write anything you want to imagine. If you want uh, some kind of aerial drone shot of a sequence that's happening, you can put that in your script and you never have to worry about how am I ever going to make this yeah. further down the line. But I'm finding with my, with my solo shows, I'm very focused from the outset on how I'm going to deliver that work to an audience. Mm. I've got to ask you because it's near and dear, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Mm. What do you prefer? Characters, mm -hmm. action, or dialogue? <sighs> dialogue. Yeah. Dialogue. I love, I love to write dialogue. Mm. Uh, I love to kind of the challenge of tuning into how people really speak and of trying to express to an audience the things the character is not saying. Mm -hmm. So all of the subtext and things that you want to apply that that character is never going to verbalise, it's a challenge to get that into dialogue that sounds mm -hmm. naturalistic. We spoke before we uh, start uh, uh, recording about, you know, one of the people I think writes the best dialogue in cinema mm -hmm. I've ever come across, which is Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Um, is there any uh, similar in, in your, shall we say, uh, uh, Ambit. In my ambit, yeah. in my in my output to date. Well, but no, 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 no. Is there anybody you uh, see in cinema or hear mm -hmm. in cinema and you say, God, I wish I could, I wish I wrote that line, or I just love the way they they frame their dialogue. Is there uh, anybody that uh, has, shall we say, influenced mm. you to the same degree? Oh, that's a good. That's a very good question because, like you, I think my kind of favourite go-to for writing dialogue would be. Tarantino, I think, especially those that opening sequence of Reservoir Dogs is just spectacular, the way they're having this completely tangential conversation, and yet you get an insight into how the mind of each of those characters works. It's just he does that masterfully. But in terms of non-naturalistic dialogue, I recently read the screenplay for Poor Things, mm -hmm. and that did... You did like it. I, I loved the screenplay. That did strike me with the, mm -hmm. the particularities of people's speech. So that, that's an example of people speaking the way no one you would encounter in reality speaks, but mm -hmm. it works for that world, for the stylization of that world and for yeah. the things it wants to express. So I have to ask you, do you ever read the Bible there, Ella? I do, yeah. There's this chapter, Ezekiel 25, verse 17. Mm -hmm. You read the Bible, oh. Greg? Yes! Oh, there's this passage I got memorized. Sort of fits this occasion. Ezekiel 25:17. The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. One of the great scenes of cinema uh, in uh, Pulp Fiction. You didn't grow up in Dublin. No. Okay. One of the things I enjoy about Dublin, there's many things that I'm critical of, but one of the things I enjoy is, is that Dubliners speak the way they see mm. the world. Mm. Um, and I don't know if you're actually familiar with the commitments where they really do speak the way on the north side of, uh, of how we speak. Have you picked up any of that in your travels, particularly on public transport, where, uh, which is almost, uh, it's, it's like a rich seam of dialogue? Yeah. Uh I, I've been saying this for a while that you can, all life is on the red line of the Lewis, right? You can overhear some really startling yeah. things mm. and get snapshots of all kinds of well, worlds you didn't know about. Well, I can recommend the 27 bus 
The 27 bus. The 27 bus <laughs> that goes to uh, Clear Hall, yeah. particularly on a uh, Thursday, be sent of Mystical Home on the Orient on the 27 bus. Right. And the dialogue that goes with it yes. is just uh, sensational. Right. Yeah, but now the reason why I ask is the commitments, I, I think, has some great lines mm -hmm. in it, like. Uh, you know, the Irish are the blacks of Europe, and the Dubliners are the blacks of Ireland, and the North Siders are the blacks of uh, Dublin. Oh I'm not black and proud of it. <laughs> um, or, or, or the other great one, uh, when Colin Meany um, says to his son, who was that? And he said, he said he's on a mission from God. And he said, what? On a, on a fucking Suzuki? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That, that is the way we talk. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. who knows? Perhaps you've got that Dublin uh, play in you there coming up mm -hmm. one of these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me now, as you say, uh, I saw um, it was called Normal Turmoil. Yeah. Then I saw Looking Sis. Looking Sis. That's what it was. Looking Sis. And now we come up to Unhooked. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding, and I want you to clarify this for uh, people, is that Unhooked is a development of a uh, normal turmoil. Mm -hmm. How correct is that? So for people who've uh, seen the first one. Yes, mm -hmm. that, is, that is correct. So normal turmoil was a work in progress reading at Seen and Heard in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, at that time the script was a two-hander so I was working with my really wonderful talented friend Danny Mahoney who was taking the other parts. Um, he's just so much fun to work with, so yeah. easy to get on with. Um, and then I had that run of Looking Sis yeah. at the Gay Theatre Festival. And it was off the back of that that I was beginning to focus my mind and focus my attention on this piece of becoming a more robust writer, performer, solo theatre maker. Yeah. So Unhooked has been through a complete rework since I was producing normal turmoil. The script has been totally revised because now we only have one performer presenting it. And I had support from the Arts Council to rework that script and mm. to work with director Anna Simpson who's been doing some movement consultancy with me. She's a real expert on physical theatre and how you can create characters through the body. Mm. So we've been doing some really exciting performance work about how how do you answer this question I had of how can one person present a whole world mm. of characters. So that's a really exciting challenge that's ahead of me. So it's 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 evolved from, mm. from that normal turmoil piece, but now it is, um, the stakes feel much higher, it's much more ambitious, there's more pressure on me in terms of the performance sure. as well. I should add to uh, people that Big Sis, it was also invited to uh, have a performance at Transfusion, mm. Mm. Uh, which is quite a, a tribute to yourself because you're not a trans person, mm. um, and generally that is for trans artists. Uh, so how did how was that received and how did you enjoy that? Well, it was received. It was received really well and really warmly by that audience. I got some nice uh, feedback from people on the day. But the that's really one of the elements that looking cis in terms of the story is trying to address. If you are a non-binary person, where do you fit? Especially if you're a non-binary person who hasn't particularly manipulated their appearance. Mm -hmm. Does that invalidate your identity? Do you belong yeah. with the trans people? You definitely don't belong with the cis people, yeah. right? <laughs> but mm -hmm. where is your community and where is your solidarity? So mm -hmm. that is the question it's addressing and that, that audience got it. It was yeah. great. I should uh, tell you, this is purely apropos of nothing. For the la in the la last week and the week before that, uh, I was getting abused left, right and centre on social media, mm. invariably by trans people and mm. the big thing that they were all going on to me about was, oh you're a white male, you're a yeah. cis male mm -hmm. and I said hold on, mm. I'm a queer Jew, mm. you know, take whatever you take, take whatever label mm. you want. And, uh, so the whole thing of what is cis and what is not cis, to me it's meaningless, mm -hmm. you know, you are who you are. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, uh, I'm glad that they actually received it well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So let us get on to Unhooked, um, yeah. which I mistakenly uh, was calling Unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> I think that works, Michael, uh, actually. That could un be un unhooked. <laughs> now, one of the things that people were saying after normal turmoil is, mm -hmm. Oh, it's very autobiographical, is it? Now that's what I'm going to ask you now. Is uh, clearly we put ourselves into uh, uh, into work, and people yeah. always say write about what you know yeah. uh, best. Yeah. Um, uh, and I don't want you to spoil what it's about for okay. people, but um, just so people all understand, is the character a character? 
Yes, the character is definitely the character. I think everything everybody writes starts with an autobiographical motive, or it should at least start from things you have witnessed and have insight into. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're not giving anything to the audience. Mm -hmm. There is no point in you writing that story unless you've got some kind of unique, authentic mm -hmm. insight into it. So I think that there's always that question of how autobiographical is a character. Mm -hmm. But the work I've done on developing this play over the past year, and especially working with Anna, has been very focused on how do you take yourself or people you know very intimately as a starting point for a character and then transform it mm -hmm. so that you have the psychological distance and the objectivity to perform that person, critique them, present them to, to other people. So that I've been very focused in this work on differentiating any and all of the characters in the play from myself or from other real people that they could have started with. Okay. I mean, don't want to spoil it for people. I have sure. read the script and I, yeah. uh, you know, so I'm a bit more familiar, but uh, tell the audience what they can expect when they come along to see Unhooked in the sense mm. of... How would you like them to, say, exit the play? Would you like to, uh, like them to, uh, shall we say, have some empathy for the character? Yeah. Would you like them to come out and say, uh, there's an element of self-affirming there? How would you uh, describe that? Yeah, absolutely. So the play is about a woman who enters a step-based recovery program for yeah. sex and love addicts after she's been in an abusive relationship. So I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying it's very focused on the themes of addiction and recovery. Um, and I think, yeah, one of my motivations for writing the play certainly was around that piece around empathy of what is it like to be someone who has exited an abusive relationship but still feels the pull to return to it? And what do other people around her think of that right. decision? Because it's very easy to, to judge someone in that situation, to advise where maybe your advice is not at all helpful, or to feel totally helpless. If you see, if you have someone very close to you returning to an abusive relationship and you're worried that they're going to be exposed to, to violence, mm. you can feel really helpless and not really quite know how to support them or how to intervene. So one of the motivations for this was to give people a little more insight into the psychology of that and what's useful and what's not useful and, and how people have to reckon with it and come to an understanding on their own terms about how they're going to exit, when they're going to exit and mm -hmm. what's going to happen in their lives next. So yeah. I'm, I'm hoping at the end it's, it's got a kind of yeah. uplifting Well, we always, we always like to warn people, and I have discussed this issue in the past, you know, mm -hmm. when we talk about addiction, you mm -hmm. know, the, uh, the media, the guardy and the medical profession, yeah. they're always great for saying, oh, marijuana, that's the gateway drug <laughs> or whatever. What's the gateway drug for, uh, for sex? <laughs> You know the answer to this one, Michael. <laughs> you want me to say masturbation would be the, <laughs> the gateway drug for sex addiction. Well, 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 I could have said, uh, and this is where it fits in with the theme, self-love. Self-love. <laughs> self-love. Oh, no, self-love is the, the recovery element. That's the cure uh, okay. for, the, for the addiction. Yeah, well, or uh, what Kellogg's uh, used to say. Bowl of cornflakes. <laughs> no, night pollution. <laughs> That's what they invented cornflakes, was so that, so that it would, uh, it would, shall we say, it would neutralise night pollution. You know, like, yes. It's a bit like a, a Horlicks, you remember that? I, I haven't had a Horlicks. No, me. neither have I, no, but they used to have these ads for Horlicks that say, night starvation. Because I, I mean, good. yeah, I mean, and they, it, it was very simple. I had night starvation recommendation, Horlicks. I mean, I never knew I was starving in, when I was asleep, mm. but that's a separate mm. But I've always said to people that, um, Love is a much more complex emotion. It is, uh, the first, and it, dare I say it, love starts with oneself. It mm -hmm. doesn't start with an outsider. Mm -hmm. And that was something I was curious when I read the play, uh, I read the, uh, the, you know, the dialogue. Is it about somebody who is essentially looking for what society tells you you should be? Mm. In other words, oh, you should be, you know, you should be in a relationship, you should be heterosexual, you should be this and that and the other. Because if you go the other way, you say, hey, I love people, I love sex, I love lots of people, I love lots of sex with lots of people. That also is a taboo in mm -hmm. itself. But to actually find, you know, uh, I won't go into this too much now, but to say that as society tells you, particularly our society, is that um, love is one on one. Yes. Um, yeah. Now, is that something that causes the anxiety to the character, or is, is that something that's going to come out? Yeah, that is a very important 
element of that they've internalised a lot of the received wisdom about the social importance of having that central heteronormative, lifelong, exclusive, yeah. romantic relationship. Yeah. As we all do, we all live in a culture where that yeah. is the norm, and the, the other messages that come around that are things like love has to be worked at, it should be challenging, relationships are not easy, etc, etc, etc. And those are the kinds of messages that actually keep people in situations that are detrimental to them mm -hmm. because they feel that obligation, they feel the commitment, they know that they're following the right social script by being with someone. So actually getting out of a relationship is really hard because you mm -hmm. are bucking against all of that messaging and all of that inertia. Yeah. That is one of the things I wanted to yeah. capture, just how difficult it is. Without challenging you too much on this, uh, and I'll put it to you, in men, I would have suggested that Monogamy is quite a recent cultural development, mm -hmm. and it is potentially a minority cultural development in a lot of places around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, so when you say it's uh, it's not easy to get out of a relationship, mm -hmm. psychologically, you mm -hmm. perhaps are right. Mm -hmm. But in certain parts of the world, all you need is three bearded men to say, I divorce you, and that's the end of it. Um, mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, that's, it, it, it is actually, but there would still you, be, still be a psychological person. fallout. Pardon? From that, for the person who was being rejected, there would be huge turmoil and fallout. Well, it's, I don't know. I'm not. A, I've never been part of that culture, so I right. don't know. You, people yeah. may be conditioned to accept it. There is. There is, um, the tradition in 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 Islam of the yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, thrice divorce. But actually, the when I was reading the Quran recently, what was being suggested was that you should not marry the same person more than three times, right? So it's a, you can only get divorced from someone three times. Yeah, because at that point you have to stop going back. And actually, that would be useful for the character in my play to hear. <laughs> like, so it, you don't, you shouldn't be going back. <laughs> Sometimes some things just won't. So if, if Elton work. Musk is, li is listening to this, you've only got one more. Go. Yeah, sure. and, and the yeah, same. Yeah. Well, poor old Elizabeth Taylor. We always reckon that uh, Elizabeth Taylor married everybody she slept with because, <laughs> and, uh, and she did marry a couple. Of, I think it was a Rick Burton. Rick Burton. She married twice. Yeah. Yep, so, yeah. Um, so she didn't go back for the third. No. The well, third <laughs> By that stage, I don't think poor old uh, Mr. Burton uh, was up to it. Uh, but he didn't—he didn't marry a younger person, didn't he? Um, he did. He married James Hunt's ex-wife or something like that. But such are the ways. The important thing now, uh, and this is what uh, we all need everybody to know: mm -hmm. where and when can they go and see it? Because we are recommending. Uh, I've seen the, if you like, I've seen the prequel, yeah. uh, and I have uh, read the script, and I am thoroughly recommending it to everybody. So when and where is it going to be on? It is on from the first to the sixth of April in Smock Alley Theatre. So we have the preview. Down by the keys, uh, by Cable Street. Bridge. That's it, in Temple Bar, mm -hmm. right in the centre. Uh, we have the preview on Monday the 1st of April, which is April Fool's Day, but also a bank holiday. Uh, that's at 8pm. I think that's the Easter bank holiday, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got shows Thursday, Friday, Saturday at 8pm, and a matinee on Saturday at 3.30. Last but by no means least, might you develop it into another medium? Yes. I might. It's a it's a rich little world that yeah. I have in my mind there, and there's definitely more stories that could go into it. Well, uh, the theatre you're very structured in the way yeah. it can be presented, whereas yeah. other way other media, as I say, yeah, uh, could be. And of course, we will also have the uh, the audio. Alice Kolomolsky, we wish you all the best. Break a leg, as we say, Thank and we you, look Mike. forward to seeing it. Thanks very much. <laughs> Stronger